About a year ago, two of our favorite Muay Thai fighters, Super Lek and Rod Tang, had one of the best fights that I've ever watched. It was an absolute masterclass in striking. In today's video, we're going to break down the underlying anatomy and kinesiology of a couple of strikes from each of these fighters. From Rod Tang, we're going to look at two different elbows, and from Super Lek, it'll be an elbow and a roundhouse kick. Let's start with the first elbow from Rod Tang. All right, so this first strike is an uppercut from Rod, uppercut elbow from Rod Tang. We've got one view out to the side and then one view from behind. And they're gonna show us different things, but I wanna start with the first view, and I want you to take away two things. The first is how quickly he starts to generate that force from his back leg. So he's extending his hips and he's pushing off using his calf, so the plantar flexion with the gastroc, soleus complex, and then hip extension with help from the hamstrings and the glutes. But one thing that we've talked about before is that dissociation, what can be helpful is the dissociation between the plane of movement of the hip and the plane of movement of the shoulder, particularly in strikers who have very good hooks like Ilya Teporia, who we covered before, and also Ryan Garcia, that's the most obvious. And as he's moving forward, you, you notice that he doesn't really do that. So his hips and his shoulders are staying along the same plane of movement. And that's because with something like a elbow, when you're throwing an elbow in Muay Thai, you really wanna stay nice and tight and compact. So just the awareness, uh, the ability to make sure that you're staying tight rather than trying to take advantage of something like that stretch shorten cycle that we've talked about so much isn't always necessary when it comes to striking. So big press off the ground, which we know that ground reaction force coming through the body, through the hips and the upper, upper thoracic spine through the arm starts on the ground. He's got the center mass moving forward his trunk is staying relatively isometrically contracted here, and that's only until he starts to make contact. So we've switched to the next view. As he brings that arm forward, we're gonna look at three different things. We're gonna look at his head, we're gonna look at the muscles of the upper arm, and then we're gonna talk about the general movement of the thoracic spine uh, and a muscle called the serratus anterior whenever it's appropriate. So one thing that you'll notice with, with Muay Thai fighters, particularly these two, is that they're gonna take every single detail that they can and maximize it for leverage and power. That's why it feels so different whenever really good Muay Thai fighters kick you, elbow you, and punch you. It's because these guys just nail the details. One of those details is priming the thoracic spine with the cervical spine. So the movement of the cervical spine to the right, so right cervical rotation, actually acts as a defensive measure as well the right cervical rotation can actually prime the upper thoracic spine to rotate to the right as well, which is gonna help him when he follows through the movement. Now, as he rotates, does right cervical rotation, he's flexing at the, at the glenohumeral joint. This is just typical shoulder flexion. The elbow is just flexed as well so that he can strike with the olecranon process at the end of the ulna. So this happens for muscles like the anterior delt and the bicep some of the upper claviculars of the pec, and even really small muscles like the coracobrachialis. And as soon as he makes contact, boom, that shoulder, watch this shoulder, is going to start sliding around the thoracic spine. And that happens due to a co-contraction with the anterior delt of a muscle called the, the serratus anterior. It really helps protract, that's the movement that the the scapula is doing there, protraction. So as we wrap it all together, it's right cervical rotation, glenohumeral flexion, scapular protraction, and then that follow through with right thoracic rotation. Now let's look at the first elbow from super leg. Okay, so I really like this view because it shows a lot of what makes a lot of the magic happen for super leg with this nice horizontal elbow. We're going to start with his striking arm and then we'll go to his non-striking arm and then we'll talk about kind of the movement as a whole. So we start after he's got the clinch. With the striking arm he abducts the shoulder using muscles like the middle delt. As he's doing this he's kind of coming around into internal rotation and then horizontal adduction at the same time. So we know from muscles like the or from punches like the hook that we've looked at before with multiple strikers that it happens at the pec, with the pec major and the anterior delt. But with this shoulder internal rotation, pec major also does that as well. But another muscle that does that is the lat. Most people don't realize that the lat is an internal rotator of the glenohumeral joint. 
and it's actually pretty cool. You can see the reverberation after the contact is made going through the lat here. That, that just, it's just how lean he is. Uh, another thing that you see is, remember we talked about the serratus anterior, keeping that shoulder blade protracted for a really good follow through. You see how flat it is against the thorax of his body there. And you can even again see the outline of the lat. That's classic follow through. The shoulder blade really helps deliver the rest of the upper arm in that, that instance. As this is happening, we've got the other arm. So we see that he's got his forearm flexors, his finger flexors, coming all the way up to the proximal radio ulnar joint. He's also flexing his bicep isometrically to keep him in, in position, along with horizontally adducting against him. So he's got finger flexion, forearm flexion, elbow flexion, and the horizontal adduction, all helping him keep, isometrically keep him in position so that he can strike. Okay, so that's a fairly straightforward one to go through. As he makes that contact, I want you to look at his upper body. Again, we've, the last view we, or last strike we talked about with, with Rod Tang, his, his shoulders and his hips really don't dissociate that much. They do a little bit here. You can see his hips start to, to rotate some right there, very subtle, and then his shoulders may be a little bit lag, but I, it's not as much, right? It's not nearly as much as you'd see from somebody, again, like Ilya Taporia or Johnson or Ryan Garcia. So, so once contact is made, again, that shoulder protracts and helps deliver the arm for the really good follow through. So this one was filmed originally in slow-mo, so we'll do it, we'll let you see it all the way through one more time, keeping all of what we just talked about in mind here. Nice. Next is gonna be the second elbow from Rod Tang. All right, so this view is a little bit unique because it shows Rod Tang's ability to create space and I think use a little bit more movement efficiency in these tight situations, at least with upper body strikes than super leg. Certainly not with lower body strikes like kicking or kneeing or anything like that, but I think that Rod Tang has a really special power here. And I think it comes from what we talked about earlier. So we'll just go ahead and get into it. Whenever he extends his neck, he also rotates it and side bends it away. And if you notice that, he, the thoracic spine follows. So it's a priming movement, extend right rotation, right lateral side bending, that also happens at the thoracic spine just to help generate more power within the trunk muscles to deliver the extremities like the elbow into the strike. So it actually looks like he's abducting and he kind of is, but once it makes contact, you'll see that the follow through is more along the plane of horizontal adduction with the muscles like we talked about before, pec major uh, and anterior delt. So he kind of abducts in the beginning with his striking arm as he rotates his cervical and thoracic spine away and then follows through. But I also want you to pay attention to the clinching arm. So it looks like he's gonna use the clinch like Superleg does, but he actually doesn't. He extends that arm and he, sa he sacrifices the clinch for a little bit of extra power. So he extends the shoulder with muscles like the posterior delt and big muscle like the lat, just to help with a little bit more of that whipping motion and the rotation that occurs once he makes that strike. So. It, it's, a, it's too short of a, a thing to watch, it's too short of a clip to watch all the way through, but keep all those things in mind as I let it kind of, I'm gonna try to do it in one little fell swoop here. Boom, really nice. And now the final and my favorite view is going to be the roundhouse kick from Super Leg. All right, so this one admittedly is definitely gonna be my favorite to break down. Okay, this is a roundhouse kick from Super Leg. Not only are we gonna look at this one, we're gonna compare it to a traditional kickboxing round. Now this is a switch kick and he's, he's kicking up high rather than kicking down low. But there's a couple of differences that I want you to notice between something like a traditional kickboxing roundhouse kick and a just absolutely beautiful Muay Thai roundhouse kick. So the first thing I want you to notice is the amount of hip extension that occurs when he's stepping back. So right there is, is as much hip extension as Alex Pereira gets. It, he looks like he gets a little more when he gets some there, but it looks like he gets a little more than he does because he's leaning back. And again, he's leaning back because he wants to kick a little higher, but the amount of hip extension and the hip thrusting movement or the, from the glute engagement right there, I mean, that's just putting a ton of stretch 
on muscles, particularly like the rectus femoris that cross the hip and the knee. So it flexes the hip and flexes the knee. And we know that if we get that quick eccentric movement, which is what's happening here, that concentric is going to be even stronger uh, due to that stretch shorten reflex. So a little bit more hip extension. As he turns over, we're going to move up a little bit higher on the body. Boom, right there. So a couple things. Look at the plane or look at the movement of the arm compared to the plane of the torso. So Alex's arm could be way back here and maybe could have gotten a little bit more counter movement and whip in that kick. Not that he definitely, not that he needs it. I mean, the dude can touch people in the leg as we, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that video, but he just touches people in the leg with like barely kicking and they just like go down. But that amount of power that is just why it feels so different whenever somebody who's really good at Muay Thai kicks you uh, along from other reasons, but they've got all of these really tiny details nailed down. So ton of hip extension, ton of swing in the arm. I also want you to notice when they make contact, look at Alex Pereira's trunk. It's not nearly as flexed and his cervical spine isn't as flexed as Rod Tang's or excuse me, as super legs. Boom. So super flexed trunk here. His anterior chain is super engaged. Muscles like the rectus abdominis and the obliques as well. Not only that, watch how he kind of slings his head down as he kicks. This is what Rod Tang was doing with his elbows. He's almost like he's preparing the body and priming the body to flex the global trunk flexion, cervical flexion, hip flexion, all the way through contact. Boom. So this, this is a, these are a couple of things that differentiate a lot of the power generated from a Muay Thai round kick versus a, a regular kickboxing round kick. Notice he's, his head is not nearly as flexed as Superlex was. So Let's just watch it one more time and note the differences. So not as much hip extension, not as much of an arm swing, and then not as much trunk and neck flexion as whenever Superlac does it. Hip all the way thrown forward and extended. That arm swing is already coming through. As soon as he makes contact, his head and his spine are all like maximally flexed and just all that snap and power goes through Rod Tang's leg. If you ever need to watch how the best of the best do it, either come back and watch this video or just watch the original fight that I've got linked in the description. Now hopefully you've got a bit more of an understanding of the underlying anatomy and biomechanics of these guys striking. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.